morning. Um, uh, this is an event organised by the Classical Cooking Music Society, uh, and we were established in uh, 2006. We organised really groups, public fora, uh, research and journalism, focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old, 1920s to 1930s, new, 1960s to 1970s, and post political 1980s to 1990s left the possibility of emancipatory politics today. Um, and in London, in, at Goldsmiths, we host a reading group on Monday night, um, uh, 6 to 9 p.m., uh, and a coffee break on Thursdays, um, usually today, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, so we just meet in local if anyone wants to come and talk about politics in general. Um, and then we organise panels like this, and um, I'm very pleased and happy to have our speakers here today. Um, I'll just uh, possibly um, read the panel description first and then introduce our speakers. Does that make sense or shall I do it the other way around? Introduce panel speakers first, maybe I'll do that. Um, so uh, our panellists are from left to right. Um, Jack Conrad, who has been involved uh, in organised communist politics. Uh, he and Comrade split from the old official CPGB in the late 70s and published the Leninist Journal. Uh, they participated in the miners' strike in 85 and then formed an organisation adopting the name of the CPGB, CPT, for the World Committee, when the older party had disintegrated in the late 80s. Um, Jack's the chairman of the CPGB and they also published The Weekly Worker, so we can get copies there. Uh, he's been with a number of books and pamphlets, most recently Fantastic Reality, uh, Study of Marxism and Religion. Next we have uh, Elaine Graham Lee, who's a long-time socialist environmental campaigner and member of Counter Fire, and I think she's written widely and um, also been involved in that stuff more. Okay. And um, uh, next along we have uh, Jamie Green, who's with a student activist uh, at Royal Holloway in the National Campaign Against Feed and Cuts and a trade union organiser with GMB. Um, he was vice president at the SSU uh, at Royal Holloway on a socialist platform. Uh, he was involved in a socialist campaign for a Labour victory before the last general election, and he's now uh, studying a part-time master's um, here in political communications and has been chair of the Labour Student Society at Goldsmith since November. Um, he's also a member of the Vauxhall Labour Party and Lambeth Momentum. Um, <coughs> And then uh, finally, we have Judith Shapiro. Uh, Judith gained a PhD in economics from LSE in 1966. She returned to LSE to teach in 2005. In the meantime, she spent two decades as a revolutionary Marxist and leader of the Spartacist League. On leaving to Trotsky's politics, she grappled with the contradictions of the Soviet economy history um, and history as a senior lecture, lecturer in economics at Goldsmiths. Uh, and then as Secretary of the British Association of Soviet and East European Studies, she was lecturing in the USSR when Gorbachev came to power. Uh, she joined the SACS team, advising the Russian Ministry of Finance in the turbulence of Moscow between 1993 and 1994, and her research on Russia's mortality crisis dates from that period. Um, so thanks very much to everyone for coming. Um, I'll just read uh, aloud our uh, panel description. So this panel, um, Socialism, <coughs> Democracy, Social Democracy, um, it's uh, also taking place uh, at, um, uh, in, in the States and in uh, Germany, where we also have chapters. Um, so this is the panel description as we're thinking through um, uh, these questions. So the conditions for... The novel political formations of Syriza and Podemos developed out of the disintegration of traditional de social democratic parties in Greece and Spain. Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the new Labour Party in Britain, has argued for greater democracy needed in the party and has invoked Labour's origins in working class organisations. Yet it is unclear exactly by this invocation what exactly is being remembered and what is being forgotten. Bernie Sanders' campaign in, uh, as a socialist candidate for leadership of the US Democratic Party appears equally obscure. Precisely when historical consciousness is most necessary, the project of social democracy seems to be fading from memory. Little remains of the foundation moment of social democracy today, both in practice and in thought. 
In the late 19th century, working people's responses to capital was expressed in the political, in the political demand for socialism. This demand galvanised the formation of the European Social Democratic Parties, guided by the ideology of Marxism. Among the most influential members of the German Social Dem Democratic Party, the political leaders of the Second International, agreed that the primary task of Social Democratic Parties was to bring about the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is, the decisive political struggle between capital and labour. And while some of these leftists ultimately found the revolu revolution too risky in the decisive decades of the 1910s and 20s, even their political judgment as far as the left as far to the left of those uh, social democratic party members who, after World War II, openly espoused the integration of, work, of workers into a more just and much more democratic social capitalist order. Um, once a global movement for the self emancipation of the working class, today's social democratic parties have fully substituted the, the, the task of educating workers in order to overthrow capitalism with the task of creating and maintaining the conditions for a more just market economy. The present standpoint of social democracy is society as such, bound by national economies and mediated by the state. So social democracy today promises to fight social injustice in the name of the people, but it no longer pro promises to realise socialism. Yet what remains is the name, and with it the promise and the problem of social democracy. In this panel, we would like to investigate this transformation by looking at the history, birth and decline of social democracy. How can we understand the historical crisis of social, social democracy for the left today? If, how, if at all, could the trage trajectory of social democracy shed light on problems yet to be superseded on the left today? Um, so without further ado, I'll invite our first panelist, uh, Jack, to speak. I'll be asking each panelist to speak for about... 10 minutes and then we'll have a couple of minutes each to for our panelists to respond to each other and then we'll open up for more discussion. Um, so, Jack. Yeah, thanks very much, Ruth. Um, I've got a feeling that we won't actually disagree very much uh, on this panel. I've got a feeling. I don't know if it'll be accurate oh. or not, but we'll see what we, <laughs> see what we come to. Okay, first of all, I think, you know, in terms of Lucy's introduction, what is clear is how slippery words are and how, you know, a word in one century can actually be the opposite in the next. Um, you know, in terms of my generation, I can remember a gang of four who were the right wing of the Labour Party establishing the Social Democratic Party. At the same time, it's worthwhile remembering that uh, V.I. Lenin and the Bolsheviks called themselves revolutionary social democrats. How, you know, these two are the same thing? Well, of course, they're not. It's merely the word uh, that is the same, although, obviously, if we treat it historically, we can see that these things are arbitrarily um, established. I mean, in that sense, we can look at the word, the dictatorship of the proletariat that Lucy mentioned. I think, famously, Hal Draper, in his study of Marx, and uh, Engels, I think, worked out, didn't he, that the two of them had used the phrase 12 times or whatever throughout their lives. Certainly Marx takes hold of the term uh, dictatorship of the proletariat, which began as an elitist term, a sort of educative dictatorship, in, in the sense that you and me would understand it. And I don't know what you want to call it, turn it, on, turns it onto, its, on, onto its feet, whatever description you want. The important thing to understand, for me at least, with Marx and Engels, is that what they meant by the dictatorship of the proletariat was the triumph of democracy. This is absolutely fundamental to realise, not least if we look at the few remaining examples uh, of societies that call themselves the dictatorship of the proletariat today. I mean, I don't know whether North Korea does or not, but you know, some people on the left might describe that as the dictatorship of the proletariat, where to me it's quite clear that there is a dictatorship, there might be a proletariat, but there's no way that the proletariat rules in North Korea, or for that matter in Stalin's Russia. And even if you look at Lenin's revolution, I think Lenin would have been the first to admit that it was problematic whether the proletariat actually ruled. So yes, social democracy has gone through 
endless permutations. I think when it was, I don't know when it first came into history, but it was way before Marx, but certainly when his comrades started to use the term we are social democrats in Germany in the 1870s, I don't know where Marx or Engels said it, but I, I, I do remember the phrase, this is a pig of a name. Uh, this was not the self-description uh, of Marx or Engels, but history presented them with this name, and basically, yes, the followers of Marxism in the late 19th century into the 20th century kept with that name. Famously, Lenin, didn't, wasn't it, in 1917, the April Thesis, says we've got to discard this soiled shirt or some uh, other phrase like that, and then they start calling themselves communists, which of course what Marx and Engels called themselves back in the 1840s. Okay, now in terms of you know, one of the questions, and I think this is the fundamental uh, question uh, that the comrades uh, want us to discuss, is have the aims of social democracy been fulfilled? I think it's, it's a very important question and a, and a very difficult question. It would be very easy to turn around and say no, uh, because it's obviously true uh, that the aims of uh, the rule of the working class being with capitalism, obviously that has not been fulfilled. On the other hand, uh, if we think about the sort of description of capitalism uh, that was contained in um, you know, Marx's Capital, we don't live under that situation anymore. We're not dealing with a capitalism uh, that if you don't have a job, you're just going to starve. You know, if we look at Britain, uh, we've had doctors going on strike yesterday to defend the National Health Service. If I broke my leg, I can go along to a hospital and on the basis of need, they will treat me. So, if we look at Capitalism, it's quite clearly not the same thing as it was in the 19th century. The very fact that I can vote uh, is not something that comes automatically with capitalism. In my view, these are achievements of the working class. The NHS, uh, you know, when I was young, council housing, when I was young, full employment, things like that. These were achievements of the working class. Of course, the capitalists claimed that they were delivering it, that we were going towards a world of leisure uh, and all the rest of it. So in that sense, uh, I think what we need to understand um, is really what went on. I don't know what date you want to use, 1914, 1917, 1918. It's quite clear that social democracy in Russia carried out its duty of coming to power, getting rid of the capitalists, <coughs> On the other hand, we take the social democracy of Germany, the most important social democratic party in the world, when they were presented with the opportunity of taking power, uh, they balked at it and basically went for a deal with the bourgeoisie. And in terms of what they could deliver, I presume it was something near to universal suffrage, lots of rights for workers, employment uh, provisions. If you could have told them that what the end result would have been, not only in 1933, but 1943, I'm sure they wouldn't have gone down that road. But it appeared to them, when they looked over at Russia, starvation, chaos, certainly the workers that followed the social democracy, that you'll be crazy if you followed the Russian uh, example. They recoiled. That did not mean, I mean, the left often uses the word traitor, treachery, and sometimes quite rightly. But I think we've, all, we've also got to understand that sometimes, yes, classes do not take power. They do a deal. They become incorporated. That, that also means that what they're being incorporated into, i.e. capitalism, is undergoing a change. And I, I, as I've tried to indicate, I think that the capitalism we're now dealing with, you could call it capitalism, but you could also call it capitalism in transition to socialism, but a transition to socialism that it cannot do because the working class isn't conscious any longer of that task. I don't believe, you know, with Edward Bernstein, uh, you mentioned the revisionist um, um, disputes, that capitalism will just evolve into socialism. I think that has to be a conscious act of the working class. 
On the other hand, it's quite clear that capitalism is in decay, it's in decline um, as a system. Um, it has given concessions to the working class. On the other hand, here we sit now, uh, and many of the concessions that we thought were, how should we put it, uh, just embedded in the system, quite clearly uh, that is not the case. Uh, and you know, education, health services, housing, um, uh, all these things uh, uh, are under attack. Uh, and in that sense, yes, it's true, we still have uh, um, universal suffrage. Um, but uh, when you look at the main parties, certainly before Corbyn, uh, the choice was between one capitalist party, another capitalist party, and a third uh, capitalist party. Okay, in my last minute, uh, we now then go on to the question uh, of these new groupings in Europe. You know, Syriza, De Linka, Podemos, Left Unity in Britain, Corbynism. My own take um, um, on these movements is I would be churlish uh, to simply condemn them. Uh, that they're all roadblocks. On the other hand, I think I'd be utterly naive uh, if I looked at them uh, to being the solution. Uh, that somehow, you know, if Corbyn came to power, well, we've already had Syriza uh, in power, I think with predictable uh, results. So I don't myself look uh, to the resuscitation of social democracy in the 1950s uh, fashion. But what I would look towards and I don't know whether we've got agreement here, I, I, this may be the controversial thing, I would certainly look towards mass Marxist parties of the sort that did call themselves social democratic in the 19th century. There's no guarantee, you know, that we won't see betrayals, we won't see another 1914. But in my view, socialism cannot come about as a result of a small group, um, some small sect. Uh, it has to be the act of the working class, and it has to be the act of the working class organised uh, into a mass party of the sort that we saw in Germany, which numbered, what, a million uh, members? So in Britain we'll be talking about two or three million members in a Marxist party. From where we are now, obviously, it seems like fantasy land, but I think that's the only way forward. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm going to start um, really where I'm sure everyone, all of us will start with, with the, with the changing definition of, of social democracy. Um, the, the way that in the 19th century that was what, you know, that, that meant revolutionaries. And actually, if you said, no, I'm not a social democrat, I'm a socialist, that was kind of defining yourself as being rather more by we than the social democrats. So it's that change from that being a revolutionary project that believed that what you had to do was overthrow the capitalist state to get um, you know, an equal society where everyone had a fair share of resources, to becoming, as we've, as we've talked about, essentially a reformist project that believes that the way you achieve power is to stand in elections, to become elected as a government, and to take it one step at a time, the kind of gradualism that Labour politicians from when they start becoming power in this country talk about, that that's, that becomes what social democracy is about. Because it seems to me that that's the kind of fundamental fracture really on the left is that division between whether, believing whether you, you have to overthrow the state or whether you can work within the state. And really the situation that um, we were talking about in the introduction where you have sort of social democratic parties that believe that you work within capitalism, I think in a way that proceeds from that belief about, in a sense, the tactics that you use. If you believe that the way that you actually end up with a just society is stand in election and get elected, then by definition that's working within capitalism because that's the system in which you're being elected. So I wanted to kind of start from, from that point. I think I'm, I'm probably going to be bad and not actually address the questions in actual words, but I hope that I'm going to cover some of them anyway. Um, because it seems to me that, you know, we're quite used to that division between, those, okay, there's the reformists and the revolutionists. But in a sense, it's quite odd that we've had to get used to that. Because if you look back at the history of the first struggles for universal suffrage for everyone to get the vote, just looking at, in Britain, it, it, actually, it actually can be a very revolutionary struggle. If you look at, um, say, what happened in the English Civil War, um, at the end of the English Civil War, there's a debate called Putney Debates, where um, the levellers are debating with Cromwell and various of the other generals on the parliamentary side about actually this question, about, well, they've all fought for the parliament, but most of them don't have a vote because the vote at that time was restricted to people who had a certain property qualification. 
So there was a great movement within people, within the army, actually people who'd been radicalised by their experience of fighting in the new model army, to say that everyone should have a vote. And the party debates were really fascinating, because this guy called Ireton, who was uh, a wealthy man, he was one of the leaders of the parliament side, um, spoke very forcefully in that about Hawaii, people who didn't have lots of property shouldn't have the vote. And he said, well, basically, I've got a nice house, um, I want to keep it. If we allow people, men, of course, because no one's talking about women getting the vote in the 17th century, if we allow men with no property to have the vote, well, there's more of them than there are of us, so they will vote to, they will immediately take all our property away. So obviously we can't give them the vote. So he was seeing that actually as soon as the mass of, mass of men, people, got the vote, that that would be a revolutionary moment and that that would completely dispossess the ruling class and therefore they didn't uh, push forward with universal suffrage. Um, and you can see again actually in the 19th century with the Chartist movement, again this was a fight for universal suffrage. And this was tremendously revolutionary. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. If you, if, um, if you don't know lots about the Chartists, I can't really talk about it in detail, but these were really, this was a really revolutionary moment. This was you know, large groups of working people on the street, smashing up rich people's houses. It's really fascinating and really fantastic. And actually, this remains this sort of thing that the ruling class in Britain feared for the rest of the 19th century. All you have to do is say, well, it, oh, it's, a bit, mm, it's a bit dodgy, we might be having the Chartists back, it might look a bit like a Chartist moment, they've got quick giving some concessions or they'll be stay, taking our stuff and smashing our windows again. So, you know, the fight for the vote and to use the vote can be, a, can be seen as a revolutionary thing. And I think the odd thing then is why you have to think, well, why isn't it revolutionary? Now, we all do have the vote. Why does it end up in this reformist place where it's step by step and you have to be realistic and you have to compromise the stuff that we're, we've going we've, to expect to see from social democratic parties in the 20th century? And I think what we have to recognise is that we're not... It's quite common on the left to talk about the failures of the left as if it's kind of in a vacuum without talking about what the ruling class is doing to the left. And I think what we have to recognise when we're talking about, well, can using the vote, using the ballot box to get power, you know, is, is that possible? You have to look, well, the ruling class is very well aware of the revolutionary possibilities of ordinary people who don't have property getting the vote. So there's a very long history of the ruling class subverting what should be the opportunity to vote to overthrow the capitalist system, so that it just becomes voting for the status quo. So there's lots and lots of examples to this from the 19th century before they had secret ballots. Um, in many places, you, if you're a working person, you couldn't vote the way that you wanted to. You had to vote the way that your employer wanted you to, because if you didn't, you'd get the sack. And where my parents live in a town in Wiltshire, there's a whole very nice... Um, <laughs> it's a very nice estate of, uh, um, sort of 19th century almshouses, which is built by one of the t- town's two main employers for the sort of 60 or so workers who were sacked by the other main employer for voting the wrong way. So this was, you know, this happened. This was a way of preventing them from using their, from using their vote to actually change things. And of course today, if you think about the power of the media, the power of, of uh, um, the communications and so on, that is put in to stop people from really seeing actually where their interests lie. Um, it's, you know, it's very persuasive. Uh, it's very interesting. There have often been um, uh, opinion polls that ask people not what party do you support, what party are you voting for, but what they think on particular issues. And actually what's really fascinating about that is that what people think is always way to the left of how they vote. Because actually this is the power of the persuasive force of the media, of the capitalist companies that persuade you that actually, well, you might want equality but actually, you should vote Tory because you know immigrants or whatever. You know, so this is kind of how how actually the promise of social democracy in the Marxist sense has been you know has been kept back, has been prevented from being realised. But we've seen that even if social democratic parties do actually manage to get elected, they haven't been able to carry out their programmes in the way that they wanted to. And we've seen that from Syriza, from Allende in Chile. You know this. This is always because, it's not because there's kind of inherent weaknesses, it's because they're up against the capitalist powers, the capitalist global powers often, which are not prepared to allow them to do what they, what they were elected uh, to do. So this is, I think, the weakness of social democracy, and it's not, it's not that it's an inherently crappy project, I think. Um, but we have to recognise that if you're thinking about, well, can we take power through the ballot box, that is, that, that's a real issue. So when we talk about, if we look at Corbyn, say, 
When we talk about, well, Cor Corbyn could take power, Cor Corbyn could be elected. Well, yeah, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, he's, he's got no chance of being elected in 2020, because I don't think that's true. I think if we fight for it, he's good, he has got a good chance of being elected. But that's not the same as him taking power. There's a difference between political office and actual political power, actual economic power. So what we have to understand is that actually going that way of thinking, well, we can get elected and we can change things, that social democratic project, when you get elected, that is the start. That's not the end of the struggle. And actually, if we want to make something of this moment that we've got in British politics, which is really quite incredible. I mean, I think there's a very good case to be made that Corbyn is actually the most left-wing leader that the Labour Party has ever had. So if we, but if we want to make something of this, we have to think, well, it's not really enough to say, right, well, he's a good chap, I'll vote for him in four years' time. That's not going to cut it. So I think what I want to say to my concluding uh, opening remarks, as it were, um, is to think about, well, how can, we, you know, how can we keep the Corbyn project on the road, in a sense? And I think the biggest danger here is for us to become spectators. That, you know, we could sit back and say, oh, yeah, Corbyn, jolly good, hope he's all right. You know, no, that's not what we need to be doing. But I also don't think that the answer is just to join the Labour Party, because I think that's actually a recipe for potentially getting bogged down in a lot of internal Labour Party infighting, which isn't necessarily the best place for people's energies. I mean, what got Corbyn where he is is actually the movement, the people on the street. And that is actually the only thing that has got a chance of keeping him there as Labour leader to get to 2020 and actually building a momentum that can, oh, momentum, <laughs> that, can, that, that can get him elected and that has actually any chance at all of enabling him to enact some of the things that he would want to do. If you look at, say, what I say um, Chavez in Venezuela, the only thing, actually, that kept Chavez in power at various points was the people on the streets. I'm not going to say that the Chavez regime is absolutely perfect, because I don't think it was, but to the extent that it was able to actually improve people's lives in Venezuela, it was able to do that because people were on the streets defending it. Now, hopefully, we won't be up against right wingers with guns, because that's not ten, tends not to be how we do things in, in Britain, although that is how we do things in Venezuela. But it's the, same, it's the same argument, in a sense, that if we want to see Corbyn in power, and if, we want, if, and if, as I think it is, we want to see this as a chance, actually, for social democracy, in a sense, to redeem itself, then we have to be part of the movement. We have to be on the streets, pushing the whole discussion to the left. So we have to be on the Trident demo, we have to be on the People's Assembly demo, and that is actually the best way to say, OK, well, we might have 100 years of history, of, uh, of social democratic failures, and I'm not going to say betrayals, but things like having Rosa Luxemburg shot, which was one of the first murders, which was one of the first things that um, social democrats in Germany did. It's kind of, kind of a betrayal. You know, if we, if, we want to, if we want to get away from that 100 years of history, I think on the streets is where we need to be. We'll do a round of clapping afterwards. <laughs> I'll come to the well done, great uh, so far. Uh, Jamie. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's not much chances for like political education at Goldsmiths, which I'm trying to change in uh, Goldsmiths Labour, so it's good you put this on. Um, I guess I'm going to start with a platitude and talk about uh, how social democracy means different things, different people. Uh, it's got different contexts in different countries due to the different sort of correlations of the labour movement within them. And um, as you pointed out earlier, it's just a wider problem with kind of like language in the left and sort of vagueness around certain terms. Um, so I guess I'll restate that. I think what I'm mainly going to talk about is um, social democracy, as I kind of see it in the UK historically, and uh, what's going on today. And I'll try and pick up a few of the kind of questions as I go along. Um, I think, uh, by and large, I think social democracy in the UK has had it's been li a limited left-wing project um, which within its early days had some very intenses between kind of the reformist evolutionary socialist ideas and people who just wanted to kind of re capitalism to sort of be more in favour of workers um, a bit like Keynesianism uh, today I think it's essentially just tied up in the right wing um, of Labour and the Labour movement and I think the term social democracy doesn't really mean much at all in lots of senses um, and I'll come on to some of those bits after. Just, just some examples. Um, uh, Parry claim, Attlee claimed to be a sort of social democrat, um, and I think that 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 forty five government um, was actually quite socially conservative. Brought in um, a program of austerity, although it did offer um, 
some progress to the labour movement and some strength to the labour movement that actually led on to it becoming very powerful, um, all within this kind of bureaucratised system of nationalisation. Um, and we've kind of got an issue in the UK because we've not really had any sort of mass force left of Labour, so there's been a bit of a hodgepodge of all these different tendencies and the left, and by and large, lots of it's sort of been attached to Labour somehow, in any sort of big way. But when the Labour movement, um, so, 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 like, but the actual union power that came out of that has actually been able to put quite big pressure on the kind of social democrats, the kind of old Labour right at times. Um, for example, in 1974, it was kind of union power that made Harold Wilson put in the Labour manifesto. Uh, they would bring about a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people and their families. Um, for me, this kind of reformist tendency sort of lost the argument as a vehicle for socialism around 1979, when a big fight happened, well, started to happen between uh, capital and the Labour movement, and Labour went on to sort of lose. Um, and actually, I think it was the right sort of social democrats in Labour who opened the door to Thatcherism, at the end of the 70s when Dennis Healy uh, embarked on an IMF-driven um, austerity programme. Um, so for me, the relevance of, on, on the question of the relevancy of social democracy today, um, I think it shows that basically reformism, social democracy, can only achieve so much until the capitalist class return to power, undo the progress that's been made, and essentially try to smash the power of labour, which happened at the end of the 70s and throughout the 80s. Um, and then just going back to some of the history on it, as you mentioned earlier, uh, there was a sort of, it, it sort of shifted more and more to the right. You had the split in Labour in the 1980s and the SDP, which wanted a social democratic party free from the constraints of the Labour movement. And that went on to create the Liberal Democrats, and some members of that went on to the last coalition government, including Vince Gable. Um, and anyway, this, so, so, so there became a big split in the Social Democrats. And the ones who remained in Labour, I would call the old Labour right, so there's people like Dennis Healy. Um, I think since then, social democracy, particularly in the context of the Labour Party, has largely been associated with sort of Blairism, um, in a kind of idea that they accept the market, but think that, again, capitalism could be slightly fairer. Um, but really, what's taken over that is the logic of the third way which could arguably be the sort of successor to the old right social democracy of old Labour, um, but it has more socially progressive <coughs> ideas attached. Um, and like another issue, particularly in the Labour Party, is the term social democracy seldom gets used these days. Uh, sometimes uh, right-wing MPs in Labour, like Liz Kendall, might use the word socialist uh, through, through very gritted teeth. And what they're kind of referring to is a kind of social democracy, but what they mean doesn't really sort of amount to very much. And if you kind of like poach, again, sort of right wing and Labour, what they mean by socialism, they just tend to come up with bland statements like they want to see a more cooperative society. Um, so in short, I think, I think social democracy has had some very limited affiliations uh, with the left in Britain through Labour, um, though the idea of concept, our concept has been sort of eroded and it now sits with the, the right. And left wing reformers, and, and left -wing reformers tend to use the term so, uh, democratic socialist. So just to look at what's going on at the moment, um, the kind of social democratic parties um, in Europe are struggling. Uh, I think the third way that got very popular in the <laughs> late 80s, early 90s, which was born out of the kitchen of Euro communism, has essentially been found out um, to be nothing of the sort. It's not a third way. It's essentially like a pro-privatisation right agenda. Um, and these parties, the, the, the parties that are left, the social democrat parties that are are struggling for various reasons, including the decentralisation of government in terms of both money and power towards transatlantic companies, the IMF, the World Bank, international markets in the EU who hold big swathes of power. And that means actually it's just not enough for a left party, where, you know, whether they're ostensibly left or otherwise, to just get hold of the state and make things fairer because um, there's just bigger constraints outside of it. And actually a really good example of that is um, Syriza. Um, so... And parties like Labour, Pessoa in Spain, PASO, Portuguese PS, they're all losing ground uh, to parties on the left and somehow. And there's also a worrying trend on the right that's causing issues for things like the Party Socialists in France, uh, social and democratic parties in Scandinavia, which have actually been hailed up by sort of reformists um, as a model and actually hailed up by Bernie Sanders at the moment. Um, and of course, we're getting a thing in Britain as well with UKIP who causing Labour... Um, troubles in northern working class seats. 
But I think I basically after the 2008 crash, uh, the kind of big shift of money and influence to the top, uh, to the bourgeoisie, um, essentially raised questions about capitalism's uh, ability to improve our lives. I think a space has opened up uh, for an alternative project that can challenge capital. Um, the issue is the projects that are coming up are basically quite vague. Um, so again, uh, for demos, um, in the Corbyn campaign, for example, they're all quite vague about like what they're about and what their relation to capital and capitalism is. The demos says it's not a party on the left or the right. So that causes a problem. But actually, there's a huge opportunity there um, because people are more open-minded about socialism. Um, and apparently, it's one of the most looked-up words last year. Um, so essentially, there's a chance for the left to to go along with this, to actually try and like shape some of the language, shape some of the ideas, um, and point to how the world could be different. Um, and I guess just uh, like my kind of last thoughts of like what you do as a revolutionary in these kind of parties like Corbyn's <coughs> Labour you know, Podemos and the rest, is that um, I think you need to go along with them and shape them. Um, it's a force that can win. We need to also like, shape the labour movement alongside it so it can fight. Um, we should work with these kind of like new reformists in my, in my notes um, as far as the, these ideas benefit the working class. We also need to convince the unconvinced, meet them where they're at and convince them of social ideas. And all along, I think it's quite important to warn of these projects, and I think people kind of touched on it, the limits of doing this stuff with the state because actually if you did have when well, I mean Corbyn's come under immense pressure from the right of the party anyway but if he did win with a radical programme in 2020 the forces of the state will come down quite heavily not only like the international markets and things like that um, but you know already people from the military unhappy about his view on Trident so I think you've kind of got to warn like where where these issues are going to come from and try to convince people that we actually need to go a bit further than this if we're if we to get to socialism um, so yeah, I essentially think these kind of new parties are popping up. They're a chance um, for us to raise consciousness um, and yeah, try and shape things. So I think that's something we'll see. Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> By the way, um, I don't want to use my position at last to do what's called poker sandbagging, and so I won't comment now on anything that's been said except that I do have to agree with Jack Conrad that we've had far more agreement than I expected, but I have a, want to push that somewhat further because the reason that I think I'm going to differ, which might have to do with the fact that my whole life, whatever my politics have been, I've been in economics, is that there's something here which is, just seems like words to me about socialism and dictatorship of the proletariat. And I've been through the whole story in which I say, we don't know what the future is going to look like, but trust me, follow me. And I'm all for the kind of struggles you're talking about today, but I'm concerned that we don't have a good idea about what a future society would look like. Sorry, we don't have any idea. If we didn't have a good idea, but we had a vague one, we would already be somewhere forward. And so I think some of the crisis that's happened is that None of us are saying it here, but I'd like to hear about that. But the idea that some sort of central planning, democratically controlled, elected, whatever, would be emancipatory, would be good for prosperity, would be against inequality, and all the things, greed, all the things we don't like about capitalism, that that disappeared. It should have disappeared a long time ago, but the reality is it disappeared even for people who didn't like the Soviet Union. It just, the reality is that the collapse of the Soviet Union whether or not it was a good experiment in showing what didn't work. That was the takeaway. And I think that also was part of the current crisis of the social democracy. I think the crisis is a wrong idea. That is, the social democracy has reinvented itself after a number of crises, in my view. But the crisis that happened surprised the social democrats, which was that when the Soviet Union was going down, they went down with it. And I remember Swedish Social Democrats feeling very hurt. It reminded me of a joke my father always liked, which was uh, in New York in, in the 30s, the policeman is beating up on a Social Democrat, very much the ancestors of Bernie Sanders' organization, and hitting him over the head. He says, but I'm an anti-communist. And the policeman says, I don't care what kind of communist you are. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever you see some socialist being attacked like that, you understand. And um, so it happened to both, and... It, that's part of the crisis, the current crisis that, that has been mentioned about um, uh, Pasok and, and what left room 
for Syriza, for example. Although it didn't come from nowhere, it came from the old communist, the right wing of the communist parties, in fact, um, and various sorts of Trotskyists who weren't getting anywhere. Um, but I don't think, unless the left has a better vision, it doesn't have to, that just these words don't sell anymore. Maybe it's because we have this prosperity. And even in countries that have been dreadfully poor, the road has been upward. And globalization has been good for prosperity, but it's been terrible for international solidarity. Because now we're much more competitors. So nationalism has become more important. Um, so if we don't think through these things about what we mean, we can continue having these individual struggles, but I don't think we're going to get that far. And I think that that's very hard discussion on what, if you don't like what some, a great deal of what the market economy produces, what's the alternative? And that's what I really, I know that's a really hard question. And I don't have easy answers, which is why I'm not against the market economy. I like the idea that the moment I'm for a more just market economy, because it's better than a more unjust market economy, which is the way we're going. And another thing that's happened for reasons we've argued about, uh, everybody's argued about, is that we really do have an age of much greater inequality. And it resembles the Gilded Age in a certain sense. And that was a big period for social democratic struggle. But then when that was achieved, when inequality melted away into moderate inequality, <laughs> um, that uh, the movement vanished. So I think I think almost everybody here has this attitude of let a hundred flowers bloom, let a, a number of struggles succeed. But if we really want to see something that's called a general left, we have to have a clearer idea of where we're going. And I don't, I, I put it finally as a question to people, which is um, if you agree, or you could be convinced, as I would argue, that the central plan doesn't work, that that model doesn't work, that we have no good idea how cooperatives work, we don't really know what we want to put in its place, would you still call yourself a socialist? Is, what is socialism to you? What's the core of that? I understand it doesn't mean anything to the social democracy, but what does it mean to you? What are these values? Because I don't think even when I've changed my politics that way, my core values have changed. And I think that people in this room probably do share those values. Um, and as a question that I practically try to think about now because it concentrates my mind, when I look at what went wrong in Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union, I say, well, what should Cuba do now? It doesn't matter whether you call it an orange or uh, a, a worker state or state capitalist. It's in a situation in which it's not going to be able to continue for 10 more years. It lost one uh, sugar daddy. Uh, uh, or the opposite of somebody buying their sugar from the Soviet Union, <coughs> and then it has lost Venezuela over the oil prices and the fall of, of that project. So what should it do? And I don't have great answers, but I know that, and I think it's the Cuban people who ought to decide it, but I wonder what you think is the way that you would suggest to them. Democratically controlled central planning, more industrialization, cooperatives. Uh, what's going to prevent them it, uh, from going back to some, almost, maybe even disintegrating into some sort of North Korean situation. Because if people don't follow what's gone on in North Korea, the socialist economy has crumbled and everybody's one man for themselves. It's barbarism there. So I put those questions, I don't want to push them too hard because I'm really happy to be the oldest person in the room for a change. When I go to these kinds of meetings, uh, usually I'm the absolutely youngest by 10 years. <laughs> and so, and there is a new generation and it's not quite clear why. Uh, and I feel as dismissive of Bernie Sanders who I knew at university and sat in with. Um, but I also know that it's revolutionary in America. America didn't have a real social democracy. Some gains were made by people uh, in social democratic Trotsky's communist parties, but it didn't have it. And that's the political revolution that Sanders is talking about. And I want to see that succeed, but I'm not sure after that what we can do if we have no idea where we're going, except cycle around again uh, with disappointment and then go forward. And I think that one reason there are young people like that is that you don't have that burden of disappointment. You didn't live through this. Even if your parents told you about it, you didn't believe them. You heard all the things about the demonstrations. And um, so, and, and finally, really, 
Uh, the other thing that was crit people were criticizing the Corbinites for when in the summer, and I know people say this about Sanders, is that the young people who support them uh, are engaged in what people say is expressionist politics. They're not interested in doing things in instrumental politics, getting somewhere. The trouble is you just want to express your values. And I began to realize that that's a very important thing, uh, as long as it's not simply um, narcissistic looking at yourself. So uh, I think that that's part of what's happening right now, and maybe we shouldn't even, I know Platypus does a great job of examining things, but maybe we shouldn't examine it too closely for about five years while we have these individual movements, because maybe we'll go f further if we don't try to sit down and design a perfect socialist economy. Anyway, thank you very much. Some interesting questions uh, raised. Um, I'd like to bring people back to just respond to each other for a couple of minutes. I do just wonder, I think this question about uh, yeah, what is socialism for people would be interesting to hear a little bit more about um, from the panel. <coughs> and also, yeah, uh, 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 in terms of political possibilities today, um, uh, there are maybe some slight differences in terms of this question of whether Corbyn uh, or Sanders should take power, um, uh, or what kind of political, what, what kind of politically, what, what kind of education or educative moment uh, Corbyn or Sanders, uh, you know, if, if they were suc successful, would we want to see them take power? Uh, what what would that mean um, to the panel? Okay, so maybe go again, please, take direction. Okay, well, what's socialism? Well, first of all, I would say that socialism is fundamentally international. Um, therefore, you know, if we look at the Soviet Union, what, whatever anyone says, it might have been a step towards it in 1917, but whatever date one wants to put on it, quite clearly it was not socialism. It not only was not the rule of the working class, it wasn't going in the direction of socialism, at least as I uh, would understand it. I wouldn't call it state capitalist, but it doesn't really matter. So in terms of what advice would I give to Cuba? Well, it, that's, to me that's a bit like saying what advice would I give to Cameron? I mean, well, it's not really my duty uh, to inform dictatorships over the working class what they should do. It's my job in that sense to say to the Cuban working class, well, first of all, we need democracy in Cuba so you can actually organise yourself so you can become part of the organised working class to the extent that it damn well exists on this planet, and it barely, barely does. But I do agree uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, in, in terms of that... Uh, I, I think the social democracy thought, whatever you want to call social democracy, but the Labour parties, the social democratic parties, as formerly called in Europe, but also the Trotskyist left. It has to be said, 1989, this is Trotskyist political revolution. We're now in for the big time. And instead of that, uh, no, this was capitalism, this was the triumph of capitalism, and the idea of capitalism. I mean, Margaret Thatcher's famous, there is no alternative. And in that sense, you know, what Judith says is very relevant. I.e., you know, we can now, you know, look at there is no alternative. Well, God's sake, I think what a lot of people are saying, and we might not know what the alternative is, but damn it, we want an alternative to this because this is unacceptable. Where the system is going, you know, in terms of climate change, inequality, another economic crash looks hardly, you know... Um, a long way off, it looks quite possible in the, in the short term. Whatever you've got, we don't want it. And, and therefore, in that sense, I think there is, yes, a very welcome questioning uh, going on. To the extent that people come up with answers, I, I don't see it uh, at the present time. Have I got all the answers? Obviously not, but I do believe that I'm part of uh, the answer, along with other people. Um, uh, in, you know, in terms of what I've heard on, on this panel. Lastly, in terms of my last minute, if I've got one more minute, 
Corbyn and the streets and all the rest of it. Look, I come from a tradition, and I think most of us do in that sense, that might have or do call ourselves Bolsheviks. Right? The Bolsheviks formed as the majority faction of the RSDLP, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. They were formed as part of an ongoing internal infighting that began in Belgium, not in Russia in that sense, but Belgium. Was it Brussels? I don't know. Usually be Brussels. Then comes to Britain, to London, to carry on the infighting. Right? That's where the name comes from. And it just strikes me that, that there are some on the left that look at internal battles and theoretical arguments and political arguments and somehow this is a diversion. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the left needs to take internal struggles and, and their own ideas a lot more seriously. And in terms of me, when I look at 2020, I'm not praying for Corbyn to come to power on the basis of what is he promising? And we've had the phrase, he's the most left-wing Labour leader since. Well, no doubt. But what is he actually even promising? Let alone, what could he deliver? We're not voting Corbyn, I don't think, in 2020. We're voting for an MP. Look at the PLP. How much support has Corbyn got in the PLP? So, in my view, the main thing that we ought to be doing in terms of Corbyn is changing the damn Labour Party. Opening, opening it up for, well, not people like you, but for people like me and people like you. And, no, that's right. Why not have the Labour Party back to how it was originally intended, an organisation for all legitimate factions of the working class movement with freedom of speech, freedom of organisation. If we could do that by 2020, my God, if I was the bourgeoisie, I would be worried. That's it. Well, I think, um, just in response to that last point, that it's, uh, it's as important what people think they're voting for than what they're actually voting for. You know, what, what people would think they were voting for by electing Corbyn in 2020 is actually more important than what Corbyn himself might think that he stands for. I and mean, that's the same with Bernie Sanders. What matters with Bernie Sanders is what voting for him means. And that's actually more important than what Bernie Sanders is actually proposing. But you only don't get an enormous disappointment then when you find out what you've actually elected if you have a, a powerful movement that can then hold them to account, not so much to what they've promised, but to what people out there who voted for them think that they've promised. And that's actually how you get a kind of a momentum for real change. You don't just let someone sit back and then see what they're going to do. You're pushing them all the time. And I, I think that it's easier to imagine that movement existing, actually including very many people who aren't in the Labour Party, as well as obviously there would be a core from within the Labour Party. So I think we do need that wider movement as well, which is my justification for not joining the Labour Party. Um, well, I wanted to, um, to pick up this point about we don't know what future society we're, we're fighting for. Because the thing is, I mean, I mean, personally, I'm very fond of central planning. I'm like, yeah, you central planning. Particularly um, with the climate change, if you're thinking about renewable energy, you kind of have to plan that centrally or it doesn't really work. Um, but I'm aware that, say, within the Green Movement, it's an intensely dirty word. And as soon as you say that, people look at it, you like you're a Stalinist. And, you know, we could decide to have a big debate about central planning in the Green Movement, which would consume it for 10 years and would drive people out of the movement, and they wouldn't do anything else except to fight about this. And I don't think that's the best use of people's time. I think it's actually, the problem is it's a divisive question. Um, and it's very difficult to imagine what a future non-capitalist society might look like when we're within capitalism. And then the other thing is that actually it's the, ra the radicalisation that happens actually in struggle. The, pe the ideas that people would think, oh no, that's completely crazy when actually they themselves are fighting a campaign about something, suddenly these things look much more possible. And the, the example that springs to mind is that, um, an occupation in a, a, a car factory that happened near where I live in North London about six years ago. Um, and they were gonna, you know, the, the company was going to shut the factory and the, and the workers went into occupation to defend it. And these were, you know, these were kind of white middle-aged guys. They're kind of working class, but quite well paid. So I'm sure they were voted Tory, to be honest. It was that sort of work, working class Tory area. And you know, after a couple of days of the occupation, they were all talking, well, this should be under workers' control. We should manage it ourselves. It shouldn't be the, you know, the multinational company that owns us. And we could turn it into making turbines for wind, wind turbines and solar panels and things. And the local community could tell us what we should be making, and we'd do that. And it's like, you, know, you do know you're describing communism, don't you guys? They're like, oh, are we? 
you know, they would never, if you'd seen them on the stall on the Saturday and you'd given them a leaflet saying that they would have called you mad, but because they were radicalised by their experience of occupation, suddenly they were imagining that that was actually how this organisation should be run. So I think it's, if we kind of start from, OK, we're going to sit and imagine what something should look like, we're not going to get there, I think. Um, very, very quickly, um, I think Lenin uh, really defined how revolutionaries should behave um, in relation to uh, sort of reformist electoral parties. And he said, look, you don't, you don't dissolve yourself into them because there needs to be that core of organised revolutionaries that can actually be at the centre of what they're doing so that they don't collapse. And Syriza would be much better off if that had existed in, in, strength in Greece. But you don't stand aside from them because that's actually where the bulk of working people are at. They think that's what politics is, is the reformist parties that stand in elections. And if you stand aside from that, you're being infantile. So... Um, stuff I pick up on what you said. I think, I think you're absolutely right. That in 2020, I don't, I don't want to just vote Jeremy Corbyn. I want to vote for the Labour movement to take power, hopefully. And to do that, you, you've got to have a massive reshaping of the Labour Party. You've got to make it far more democratic um, than it is now. And you're probably going to have to get rid of loads of like, right wing MPs. To do that, I think you need to join the Labour Party. And I think people in the Labour Party need to fight for people like yourself to be allowed in the Labour Party. So you're absolutely right. It's the Labour Party to reflect the Labour movement and different tendencies, and everyone should be allowed to put forward their case. So, um, absolutely agree with you there, and I disagree with you about joining the Labour Party because actually, if you do want to see, um, if you do want to see a Labour Party with an, a radical agenda in 2020, I think you've got to be in to fight for it. I think it's standing back and not like having a bit of a fight within the bureaucracy, as tedious and as boring it is, makes it harder. The other important thing as well is that you want to bring people with you. So, like, I'm going to to Labour Students and Young Labour Conference every weekend. It's probably going to be extremely boring, but it's a big chance to like speak to people who think they're kind of like a socialist, think they have some socialist ideas, and actually engage with them. So I'll be there with like National Campaign Against Peace and Cuts. Um, giving out literature and trying to engage with people. So I think I think that's the kind of case for getting involved with the Labour Party, as, as very, very boring as it can be sometimes. Um, but you also do stuff outside of it. I think that's what I'll you as well. You can't just leave that totality of your activism. Obviously, you need to trade unions and things like that as well. Um, in terms of, like, vision for society, there's a weird, like, kind of contradiction. I think we've all agreed that, like, social democracies end up not being very much. But as, as, just as two words, I think it kind of describes how I'd like society to be. Bourgeoisie, a programme society, all the main pillars of society are on their interests, they control them, things like the media. I think what we want the working class to do is have that, to basically run the main pillars of society, the, the social elements, things like the media, workplace, things like that. We want to run them and programme them to run in our own interests. So, so weirdly, like the, those words, I think, actually probably describe the kind of world you want to live in, it's just a shame that like, they've been attached to something that's been sort of like, quite crap. Um, and on that, I can see a question about what socialism is. I think it's a society owned and run by the working class in their interest. And again, all the different pillars that, that form society. Um, should Labour take power of Bernie Sanders? Well, yeah, what are you going to do? Tell, say to the Tories in 2020, to actually go on, you take power, or actually Republicans, you have it. Yeah, of course, but the reason you do that is not to just go in and like, make compromises, just to actually go and like, have a bit of a fight and like, draw some of the... Uh, to draw those things to a conclusion, to actually to, like, uh, fight the state on these things, to actually have a fight within the EU to make it more of a, a social Europe. So, yeah, the reason you take power is to try and further the course of the working class, but actually have a fight with these kind of reactionary institutions um, and draw those to a conclusion and try and bring people with you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't really care about Cuba that much, but democracy would be good. And in that, you'd actually want to have like independent trade unions, let's have some sort of like civil society. Um, I think that would be important within democracy in Cuba. Cuba. Okay. First of all, I feel a little bit like a fraud with my first line because I'm not even sure I'm a leftist. But when people say Jeremy Corbyn taking power, this is a fundamental misuse of the language. Jeremy Corbyn might well form a government and occupy Penn Downing Street. When I started out moving left out of the Labour Party a half a century ago, there was a phrase, whoever is the government, the Tories are in power. And that's the problem of electoral politics. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have them and just let the Tories be in power top to bottom, but 
I'm not understanding that's important, I think. It's certainly true about Bernie Sanders. It may not be so fantastical. Maybe it's just because I calm myself at night and not hyperventilate about the choice between uh, Cruz and, and Trump that the American presidency is surrounded by many things that stop it from being able to do what you want. So it can be really a very bad taste and upsetting, but it hopefully won't end the world. Um, so, so on and that. Now, on central planning and climate change. Central planning is not the same as state intervention. Central planning is what evolved over time in the Soviet Union and was copied in places like North Korea, but not exactly in China, where the state, whether whoever controls it, is telling you what you should produce and who inputs to you and what you sell and what the prices are. And if we don't have an alternative to the market, then what do we have? So how will the market fit in with state planning, which is uh, state control, which is very definitely needed. Um, I'm not against that or saying that we leave it to the market. In fact, the market is often manipulated uh, by capitalist states in the interests of other people. Um, but that's my view on it. And I, I will just leave it with this. I agree that just mostly having left-wing meetings discussing these technicalities would turn people off. But if they're not discussed and there's no better prospectus, when a mass movement starts to grow, it will not grow beyond highly politicized people. And unless, it could be that we'll have a much worse crash coming and we have world war coming and then it won't matter. But if that's not happening, that's where, why we're in. It's very nice to see all these people, but it's not a mass movement. And it's not going to grow there by its promises. Finally, on Cuba. I'm disturbed here, I don't care about Cuba, so I urge you to start reading about it because it's where it's going to be in the next decade, I think. And I obviously was not, I, I can't imagine why you thought I was giving uh, recommendations to Castro. I didn't try to do that when I was in the Soviet Union with the, uh, in Russia, rather, with the Sachs team. I'm there to watch and then talk to other people. And online, for example, there's something called the Havana Times. Some, and the bloggers there are not the kind of end, you know, pro-capitalist, everything is wonderful. And they're varied. And some of them are regime supporters. I was amazed to see yesterday that Grandma, which I can't bear to read, I spent the summer of 1969 in Cuba, and I have a perpetual allergy to this stone, this completely empty rubbish. But it has a comment section online now, and when two <laughs> Cuban baseball players defected, Somebody complained that the trouble is that 80% of the comments were against them, you know, traitors. But 20% were not. They said, people have a, you know, Cuban baseball is in a mess, and things like that. So, so you could try being online. Maybe the moderator won't allow it. Maybe they will. The Havana Times is in both Spanish and English. There's a lot of translation devices you could use. Watch what's happening and just think about it. It doesn't mean giving advice. It means thinking... What's going on here? What are people debating? What, which side would I be on? Uh, can I make any difference or not? Uh, and, and that's really all that I'm, I guess, ask, ask, suggesting people do is to be alert, watch what's happening, think about it seriously. And I agree that uh, technical uh, details are not where it's at. But on the other hand, serious discussion about what socialism is when people are Googling it, they wasn't be trending on Google. <laughs> and I, uh, I put that down to both Corbyn and Sanders. Uh, what, what is this thing? That you better be able to answer, uh, uh, as some people here have, and if you want to be uh, thinking about it, uh, it is hard work, but it's necessary. Okay, That's all. So I'd like to thank all of you. It's not the end. We will be uh, going to uh, the pub New Cross House afterwards to talk more, but um, let's start the questions now. So, um, can I, I'm going to take maybe a couple at a time. Um, has anyone got a question? Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Gina. Um, who spoke about the way in which in 1989 the Social Democrats in Northern Europe were surprised to find themselves getting sucked under the collapse of the USSR. Um, and, uh, and I just um, wanted to ask if you could say something about whether you see, how you see that in relation to other moments of potential crises of social democracy that were given in the panel description 
from earlier in the 20th century, whether that's uh, with the New Deal in America or with um, with the welfare state in the UK after World War II or with uh, Thatcherism in 1979, um, whether that, if you can speak about those earlier stages um, and how that relates to um, what the possibilities are for uh, what you said as uh, making a nicer or a, I can't remember, like a less unequal uh, uh-huh. capitalism. Well, it's not a flippant answer, but uh, in some ways it is that uh, when there was an alternative that was seen by people as whether or not you're critical of it, that put enormous pressure. And that was part, not the only thing, but it was part of what created the welfare states and the concessions. I, this is my view anyway. I shouldn't say it like this is the truth. Okay, but my view is that. And it created the ability of social democracy in combination with mass movements and, and the economic growth to ring concessions. And so that's part of what was going on. Now there's no alternative. We can be really mean. And so, uh, and as well, there was a disruption in the world economy when the Soviet Union broke up. There was in Europe in particular. Uh, and so I think that that's the, that's the most recent connection. And the stronger it seemed when um, various countries like Vietnam were going communist, the, I think you'll also see the same kind of rhythm and other people, you know, we have an alternative, and if you don't do better, we, we would like, uh, we can go there. And now there's nowhere left to go. Uh, so, so that's my short answer, because I don't want to dominate. Okay. But given that, you, given that there is no, whatever, uh, existing, existing socialism yeah. or communism, or, and there is no even uh, mass workers' movement, um, how does that bode for what you think about uh, the potentials for uh, creating less unequal capitalism now, given that, as we've just seen, uh, the existence of some alternative was crucial to any kind of reforms that workers were able to achieve throughout the 20th century. Well, I would be a pessimist, but I try not to forecast, um, because there is so much that's uncertain in the world. I mean, and and it's clear that each um, that there are many many changes right now, and it, I think a period of some economic growth would show something different, even modest. That right now people are too occupied worrying about the future, but still, um, whatever happens, I, then I am a pessimist about it. So I don't want to insist on it because I don't want most people to be pessimists. I'm just giving you my honest answer about it, but that does that mean we shouldn't try? Uh, it might not create a social democracy, but it's very likely to do a bit to defend the National Health Service, for example. I think I think like I don't totally accept all the premise of your point as well. In that, I think it's pretty obvious when uh, when the Soviet Union fell, it hit the left and, uh, in, in lots of places, and, like drains like lots of Trotsky groups in Britain even though they were glad it fell but I, I, I can see the other way around as well though I think actually Stalinism did quite a lot to set socialism back as an idea um, and I think like it's essentially pumped the words socialism, communism dictation, the proletariat it's just like kind of pumped and full of shit um, and there's only now like some of those conditions kind of wakes again we've kind of got a newer generation who can't remember it as much so I think you've kind of got to be careful with that example about like kind of what the Soviet Union and Stalinism did, because I think actually set back socialism as an idea quite far. Anyone else? Well, I, I, I sort Sorry. of agree with both speakers. I, I think it's quite possible to agree with both of the two comrades, because things can be both at the same time. So with the Italian Communist Party, with the French Communist Party there, etc., there, there's concessions being given at the same time of the existence of you know slave labour, the gulags, Jesus, I don't want that. So I, I think we can yeah. agree um, that it could be both at the same time, but quite clearly where we are now uh, is not where we would like to be. And I think that's, that goes without saying, for the reasons you say. Where's the mass movement? 
you know, of any sort, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, a vision of society. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the thing about 1989 is that certainly with the left in this country, um, it was already in a very bad place. I mean, it had a historic defeat of the, of the minor strike in 84 85. And actually, I think it was, it, it was its very weakness that enabled this kind of very right wing line of right, okay, now that that is the end of history, we've defeated um, communism, there's no such thing as socialism, it's all just right wing forever. I mean, that wouldn't have been a, that wouldn't have happened if the left in this country had been as strong as it was, say, in the early 70s, even. You know, there's a kind of a, there's an objective circumstance there. Um, and I think that that historic defeat in the 80s for the left, I mean, that kind of had that perpetuated, that carried on for a long time. Um, I'm actually, I think I'm probably more optimistic than some of the rest of the panel because I, because I think you know we've had, you know, sort of you know, 15 years or so of kind of mass movements around stop the war and things like that, and I think with sort of Corbyn and Sanders, you know, this this does actually feel to me like the beginning of the left really starting to really seriously recover from those historical things. So I think it's a uh, very interesting, and I think it's important to be optimistic about that. Okay, is there anyone else back there? Okay, so I think that. And I thought it was really right what people were saying about the need to talk about what socialism means and just the need to talk about socialism. And um, one of the things I find quite funny about the uh, Sanders campaign in America is it seems to talk to mention socialism in a democratic way than, than, than uh, Corbyn and Momentum do over here. Like it, 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 socialism is not brought up a lot. I think one positive thing that we could we could do as if you're a Labour Party member like me, is actually start talking about socialism as something that people can understand what that is and something that is distinct from just a slightly more let's hold hands and dance through the field version of capitalism. Um, and my second point is, it, it, it seems a shame to keep going on, on about the Labour Party when it's been such an interesting and, and, and wide-ranging debate. But my, my question to um, anyone here, really, who, who doesn't think that you should join the Labour Party... If you think that you just should not join um, electoral reformist parties on principle, fair enough, I can see the logic of not joining the Labour Party. But if you think that there is something positive, or at least something that presents a political opportunity in Corbynism, then I cannot for the life of me see what is gained by not joining the Labour Party. Um, Absolutely right to say, to, to bring the Lenin quote out, about not dissolving yourself into reformism, not dissolving your socialist politics into a kind of reformist mush, but politically dissolving is not the, sa- is not the same thing as joining mass reformist organisations. And in, o- in order to apply the kind of pressure that people have correctly said needs to be put on the Labour Party, it's just, it's just much more effective to, effective to do if you're a member of that organisation, if you're a member of that movement. If you want to put pressure on Labour councillors, you can do that a hell of a lot more easily if you're in the CLP. Um, um, you were talking about like, expressionist politics versus like, implementation. Do you see like perhaps a transition from that expressionist politics to more implementation, like implementing kind of politics rather than like, oh, I believe this? Do you see that the interesting saying that I'm going to do something about that, or like, do you see this kind of like without general expression? Do you see that potentially developing or snowballing into actual concrete change? Or do you still think it's quite naive that idea of like, just, like oh, this is what I stand for, but I don't know how to implement it? I was wondering if you could see that transition happening in the future, and if not, and so why. Okay. Um, uh, other people, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, Jim? Um, just right to the next slide. The next slide. The next slide. The next slide. Yeah, I mean, I think that. It would, it would be different if, I think, the Labour Party at the moment was, was open to revolutionary organisations kind of joining together and remaining organised as blocks within the Labour Party and they could exert influence and it was a whole different sort of... But clearly no one wants revolutionary organisations to do that. Um, so, it's, so what we're talking about is people who are revolutionaries joining as individuals. Um, and for me it is partly, I mean personally, you know, I don't, I don't believe that actually all we have to do is fight at the ballot box and get the right people elected to change society. So in a way it feels a little dishonest to actually join a party that's fairly explicit that that's the thing that you need to do. So, but in kind of general, I'm fairly fairly kind of, I'm not like, okay, you must not join the Labour Party and if you do, you will be anathematised. That's not at all what I'm saying. But it's about where you put your energy and where your campaigning time is best utilised. And and I hear what you're saying about, okay, well, you can influence the Labour Party, 
in a traditional in the Labour Party, much more easier if you're a member. To be honest, that's not my experience. I think it's much, personally, it's much easier to put pressure on Labour councillors, for example, when you're meeting them in the context of a People's Assembly meeting or an, an anti-cuts meeting than if you're a member of the party. Because actually, I'm much freer to be able to say, well, actually, we're going to hold you to account. And if you don't actually, you know, if, if you don't actually stand against austerity, we might be having a demo outside your council, which presumably I wouldn't be allowed to do if I was a member of the Labour Party and it's a Labour council. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe you could. I thought you'd get in trouble. Um, so I, I, I think that actually the positive influence on the left that called the Corbyn Project needs actually does have to come from outside the Labour Party as much from within it. I mean, the PLP has been very good over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years of actually ignoring what the large part of the Labour membership uh, wants. I'm not sure that I see that changing, and I really don't think that it's a good thing for activists to be spending all their time in incredibly difficult and divisive meetings. I've been through splits in parliamentary parties. It's not fun, and actually a lot of people just walk away from politics and you lose large numbers of really good activists because they just get so pissed off by the experience. I would rather have those people building people's assembly and stop the war demos. I think that's more productive. Anyone like to answer either of these questions? Yes, um, yeah, um, well, I mean, you were asking about, you know, do I think things will happen? I, yes, I do. I mean, I'm definitely an optimist, so that's a, you know, maybe it's just a um, temperament thing, but yeah, I'm not an optimist. <laughs> but I, I would say, to Jamie in that sense, you know, he's talking about going to Scarborough, isn't it? Oh, yeah, Scarborough. I personally think that's bloody exciting. <laughs> but seriously, because I, as I understand it, the left is going to be taking on the right, right? Um, you know, I'd love it if you lot won and kicked out those Blairite bastards. I think that would be a victory for all of us. So I don't think that would be boring. You know, I think that would be jolly exciting if you win. No, I, I think you will win. I think even if you don't, you could convince well, Exactly. I mean, you know, to me, you know, okay, I don't think that we should spend all our time, so let's not counterpose it, that, you know, it's meetings or on the streets. That's not the way it should be. But we don't want to decry meetings. We don't want to decry having the debate out, maybe for a month, having a vote, you lot lost, my lot won, or the other way around, right? I don't think that's somehow some side issue. I think this is concentrated politics. I think this is politics at its highest level. So, to me, I, I don't like the description of the boring stuff. Uh, I think it's necessary. Sometimes it can be boring. Sometimes it can be bloody exciting. You know, I mean, meetings where there are splits, usually, yes, do result in some people being demoralised, but you read the descriptions uh, of them. Formation, I mean, I'll just give you, I'll, I'll finish with this. The formation of the German Communist Party out of the independent social democrats in Germany. I don't know if anyone's read the description, right? This is a mass party, by the way, consisting of, is it half a million? Maybe three quarters of a million people. It's divided into two, the pro-communist side and the, the right wing. They're throwing chairs at each other. I'm not advising that, by the way. I'm not, I'm not advocating that. But the idea that that was boring, and that included an eight-hour speech by Gregory Zinoviev in German in the midst of Heckling, people getting up and saying that's a load of rubbish and all the rest of it. Uh, described by the German press at the time as the speech of the century. So uh, let's not dismiss our movement and how thrilling uh, our debates can be. Because I think our movement, does, our, our whole movement, does hold the future of humanity. You know, all of us in that sense uh, are the hope that humanity has. If we gave up, uh, then I don't think there's any hope. Uh, so I think I think I probably phrased the boring thing wrong, but I think you were right to criticise me. I think what, what I was trying to get at is that um, the right and the Labour Party have like held it for so long um, that they kind of just like hollowed it out and depoliticised it. So when I say it's boring, so you can go to a CLP meeting sometimes, and there's not very much politics talked about. You get talked about an NEP, and sometimes you can feel like your time's not being used very well. But actually, the, the important point is you've got to like, inject that politics yourself. You've got to like take motions to criticise your councillors, which momentum in Lambeth are doing. They cr criticise the councillors quite hard of us on the stuff they're doing. Um, so actually, the point why I'm in Scarborough is that the right <coughs> will try, you know, boring, they'll try and use our political disagreements as the left creating disunity, when actually, you know, we want to have a respectful, comradely debate. We want to win. 
and that they'll try and spin that. So actually, yeah, the point is, is that like the reason it's boring is because the right has just been allowed to kind of depoliticise things. But I think people should join the Labour Party. It's not only about fight about the big issues, but they should just like lighten it up and make it like the kind of thing you said. Like I don't know about eight hour speeches, not like this is that, but there should be like thrilling speeches and like showdowns of the Labour Party conference when you see our piece. So um, I agree with you that. Um, in terms of like where things are going, um, I think essentially. Yeah, I think we can get somewhere. And I think we can get socialism as the ones want to do what I do. Um, I think I think we've got an issue where, like, basically, like the labour movement in Britain, the labour movement internationally, is just taking hell of a kick in over the last few years. Um, it's figuring out lots of questions to the way the world's changed, and I think it's sometimes going to be a case of like kind of two steps forward, three steps back. So, um, Syriza, which showed us a promise like a year ago, were completely battered by the Troika. I think we're going to have loads of those just like really horrible losses along the way. But um, that's why it's important to actually convince people of the underlying ideas. That's why it's important to convince people of like what socialism is as a tangible idea. Um, because when those losses happen, they're still focused, they still know what they're like fighting for. And actually, you know, um, when you get a bit of progress, you see why the thing went really badly before. So yeah, we can go somewhere, but I think it's going to be quite difficult. Um, and just like yeah, like on, the, on this kind of like Labour thing, um, Unison in Lambeth has run quite a big campaign against councillors in Lambeth, the Labour council in Lambeth, uh, turning libraries into gyms. They're affiliated, so those are the CLPs there. Loads of members from the CLP, including myself, have been along to protests to that. So actually, I think you can I think you can criticise and protest against councillors in and out of the party. Uh, it doesn't particularly like break any rules or anything. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think you said anything there that really convinced me it's better to be outside of the Labour Party. I think it's important to fight inside and outside of it. And there's hell of a fight going on. And again, if you want li- if you want like the Labour movement to, to triumph over its foe capital, I think you need to get in the Labour Party because standing back at the moment is a bit like your mates getting hit by someone. You're just standing back saying like, well, maybe if the person hitting them comes to a people's assembly meeting, I might be able to convince them there. No, you need to get involved in the fight. So, yeah, I'll just have the point. Okay. I'll try to live up. Okay. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Yes, yes I do. Um, I'm just finding it really hard to have faith in Corbyn and his opposition party. Because I think the idea of government is to maintain the status quo, to maintain the system, a capitalist hierarchy that we have. I think for far too long we've had governments making promises and not delivering those promises but acting in their self-interests. Um, I'm just finding it really hard to have faith in, in Corbyn. I think if um, one of uh, the members of the panel can, I don't know, maybe guide me and perhaps change my view and then maybe I'll vote Corbyn in 2020. Um, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I've got one, one more, which is, well, I, I got a couple more. Um, we've talked a little. There's been talk of reform and reformism. Can we really call the Labour Party today a reformist party in the way that Marxists used to use the word reform? Um, does, do reforms mean the same thing today as when there was a revolutionary project on the table, or or, or are we talking about something else? In what what context? How do we understand reform today? Um, and struggling for reforms. Um, I think that's a really difficult question. And also, I guess I have a question about movements. What, what, what are our movements today? Are movements um, today? We we we've had mentioned we don't have a mass working class movement for socialism. Um, so, what are the movements today? Uh, what, what really is their political potential at the moment, and what are their limitations as well? Um, and yeah, on that? Yeah, um, again, I, I don't want to sort of look once more into the membership or not of the Labour Party question. I mean, okay, well, yeah, we so maybe can briefly. We, we could, could we take this question first and then come oh, yeah, yeah. back? Oh, come back. Okay. Yeah, okay, sorry, I just I don't want to pile on too much. Sorry. Bureaucratic name. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. I want. To, I just want to. I want to hear about reforms, and um, I want to hear about yes, uh, faith in, in Corbyn. And I will bring you back in. I promise. Um, faith in Corbyn. I think even the people who are arguing more strongly for Corbyn than I am are not saying you should have faith uh, or expect things to come from them. I think they are saying 
which sounds a little too much like the German social democracy at the start of the last century, but the movement is everything and the goal is, is not the point. And the, then the question is how you do that, because if you do it wrongly, as you were saying, in fact, that's where you get demoralization. Uh, people have incredible <coughs> victory parties. And uh, I mean, I saw people get, get confused about Tony Blair, very sensitive <laughs> people. And, 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 and I, well, the Socialist Workers Party had a big, I had a car then going around Russell Square and it said, hold Blair to his promises. And I thought, I don't want to hold Blair <laughs> to his promises. Actually, he kept them very well. And so uh, the sa it shouldn't be that way about Corbyn and it should not focus on a single person. And he's not the best person to be the, uh, uh, the leader of a great charismatic movement in that sense. So maybe that's a good thing. But um, so I don't think even the people who are talking about that. This is, gets back to the expressive politics in a way, that, that that's what's going on now. People don't know exactly what changes they want, but they are fed up with the status quo, as people have been saying. And um, uh, whether it's re the right thing to mainly concentrate on uh, the libraries or it's right to concentrate on generalities, I don't know. But I know that that, I think, is positive energy. The only problem is the downside. Uh, when people get demoralized. You have to be ready for that. You need experience in seeing what will happen when you fight and fight and it doesn't turn out to be what you wanted. But, uh, Would you say anything else about reform? Well, um, what happened with the Blair Project happened throughout, I know because I was involved <coughs> in, democracy in, in Western Europe but the, helping the Eastern Europeans at the time, that they all went through this period which had to do with the 19, I believe again, 1989. That is that we're going to live with the market. They discovered the market. I, used to, I believe I'm a sort of pro-market. I have I had Labor Party colleagues. I, they had discovered this wonder. And I explained to them why health doesn't, healthcare isn't really good for the market. And they were wide-eyed. Amazing. And I said, this is what I used to teach here at Goldsmiths in the first year. And um, so um, I think that it lost it then. But before then, it was already very incorporated, that the state has operated differently in incorporating people in the post-war period. Uh, so nice jobs. And <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so Corbyn. Um, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a big threat that he might get compromised into um, kind of quite a shoddy compromise program if, if, if he even gets to sort of 2020. Um, the things that can, can counteract that is a strong Labour movement. So Trade News still have about like half the votes in, in the party conference, have a big say in the round of CLPs, things like that. And a big movement behind him, so that, you know, there's a fairly sizable movement that got him elected, kind of building those powers to keep him to his promises. Um, that's going to do that and that's kind of part of meeting the working class the organised working class where it is Greer in many ways not a fan of kind of electoral reformist parties I don't think it's a reformist one but actually like again it's about getting in where people are at um, going with them as far as that project benefits the working class but also being like critical of it at the same time saying you know but you get, if if, if Labour does get into power, these, these are where things are going to go wrong, and that's why we need to go further. So for me, um, the best way to have trust in Corbyn, I guess, is to build a Labour movement and a movement behind it that can keep him to those promises, uh, should he or should he not get into power, and along the way, building something better that can take power. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's, that's clear. Um, reformism... Um, I don't think I don't think Labour's really been a reformist party for quite some time. Um, 1993, no, 1994, it said it was a democratic socialist party. I don't, don't think it was anything of the type of actually. Um, I think basically since the kind of 80s, it's just wanted to kind of tilt capitalism to be a bit fairer. If you look at loads of the candidates um, who ran for the leadership, like Liz Kendall, they just kind of accepted the mantra of there is no alternative, but we can make it a bit fairer. Um, so I, I don't think it has really been a reformist one um, per se. And um, in terms of like movements, um, it's a kind of scattered thing. Like actually, six million people in in trade union still, which is, isn't a bad number. But you're right; they're scattered across different parties. Um, the kind of sense of solidarity was there in the eighties, um, isn't there anymore? But it's still there, and that movement does have a big say. Um, oh well, it can actually do big things. 
and it does have a say in the party itself. Also, there are other movements internationally, things like Indignados uh, in Spain, which kind of led into Podemos. Uh, there was equivalent in Greece, which helped Syriza. Uh, we've had things like Occupy in Britain, and a general kind of anti movement, but they're all kind of like scattered. And I think like there's, there's a big job to try and create something coherent, like out of that, like bringing together around, like, a mass program, coherent ideas. Um, so yeah, there are movements, but they're very scattered at the moment. Um, yeah, well, I think you don't you don't have to have faith in Corbyn. I think to yeah, to vote for Corbyn or to see the the opportunity that we're presented with here. I mean, I think I think to be honest, the, the chances of Corbyn making some very fundamental compromises to get you know on the way to 2020 are probably quite high. I mean, I think personally, he has tremendous commitment to keeping the Labour Party, you know, to not splitting from the Labour Party, which frankly is why he's still in the Labour Party. Um, so I think you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't bet against him in making some fundamental compromises, but I think. The way that the, sort of the, the best way that I see this possibly playing out, and I'm not saying this is the thing that's likely to happen, is that say, say he gets to 2020 and he's still Labour leader and he's fought off the challenge of the right um, and he stands on a reasonably left wing platform, which would be perceived probably as being much more left wing than it was because there would be such a move of enthusiasm and okay, we're really changing things and people wouldn't be looking at the detail and saying, oh, well, actually, that's more reformist than we thought. No, so he gets elected. And then, as people have said, he wouldn't be a, he wouldn't be allowed to then usher in full socialism. Of course, he wouldn't. But the question then is, well, what do you do about that? Does everyone who voted for him on the basis that we were going to elect a socialist prime minister just go, oh well, that was a shame, nice way it lasted, or do they get out of the streets and protest? And then, if, and if they do that latter. That's when it starts to get really interesting. That's when you're actually looking at a potentially revolutionary moment. And that's what that's what we would be electing him for, to be frank. So it's not about having faith in Corbyn, it's having faith that this could provide us with you know, a really very, very important opportunity to actually get, well, to fight, you know, have an opportunity to fight for real change, basically. Um, I mean, the, the question about reformism, I mean, I think, yeah, it is different when it's not, uh, you know, you're not being offered reforms because otherwise there'll be revolution. I mean, they, obviously the, the, the most recent example is 1945, where I think that the welfare state does actually come out of uh, this very real fear of actually very radicalised um, proletariat who are like, you know, in the army with guns. I mean, this is, this is kind of, okay, we are afraid that we will be facing a re- revolution, so therefore we will, um, we will put significant reforms in place. Obviously it's different when, when that, there isn't, that isn't there. But, I mean, I, I, mean, I, do, I, I, I do refer to the Labour Party as a reformist party. I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's important. And it is a way of pointing out that, well, they're not actually the same as Tories. There is a fundamental difference there, and it's important to remember that. Yeah. Um, Corbyn. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I certainly wouldn't preach faith in Corbyn. Um, I'd be very reluctant to, to do that. I'd actually say, you know, if you're going to vote Corbyn, do so without any illusions. I mean, you know, if that's boosting him up, but I mean, I think we ought to see him for what he is. And uh, okay, he's the most left wing leader since whenever. But it ain't saying very much, is it? I mean, what is Corbyn actually promising? As I know, well, they could have a review of Trident, maybe NATO. I mean, so uh, I think we need to see what's possible and what's not possible uh, in this in this moment. Uh, I think that the Corbyn thing has given us on the left an opportunity in the same way that Sanders has, not that he is our sort of socialist, in the sense to put forward the arguments for socialism. And that's my version of it. In my version of it is well Corbyn's election as leader given the complete hostility of the PLP has given us an opportunity to try to change the Labour Party. If you don't succeed, you don't succeed. But I I agree that not to try, uh, to me, is just not seeing the woods for the uh, uh, trees at at the moment. Okay. Um, Is the Labour Party reformist? Well, it's a bit like what we've been talking about, social democracy and all the rest of it. If you mean by reformist, this is a reformist, um, what's the word, uh, strategy for socialism, quite clearly not. Does it promise to tinker a bit here and to tinker a bit there? Of course it does. Uh, but we're not dealing with a modern version of Bernsteinism. The, the present-day Labour Party and the majority of the working class movement is way to the right 
of Edward Bernstein and the revisionist wing of um, German social democracy. I mean, they're not talking about an alternative society. They are talking about a nicer market. But I think that's an utter illusion. I think the market leads to where we are. It's not in the interests uh, of ordinary people to promote the market. It's in our interest to actually oppose uh, the market. That's what the NHS is. That's what free education is. And the more they marketise it, uh, the less it's in our, um, well, in our human uh, interest. I will agree uh, with uh, Judith on this one again. Jamie, you keep using the word power, and I agree with it. I know you, you, know, you don't need to be lectured on this one. It's quite clear, although we say Corbyn comes to power, right, or the Labour Party comes to power, this is not state power. The, I mean, we've talked about the army threatening Corbyn, right, uh, and I think that's real. I, I don't think that's, uh, you know, fiction or... What's the name of the book? A very British coup. I, I, I think this is the sort of term that we could perhaps go into. I mean, you know... Uh, you know Explain that. Well, OK, yeah, that's right. Uh, there was a book by, by a guy called Chris Mullen, who was a Labour MP, but he wrote a very, well, famous book, at least in my circle. It was also... <laughs> about, was, it, was it a film? It's, it's on the yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah. It's like some four or two. OK. <laughs> it's a left-wing Labour government gets elected and the dark forces of the state overthrow it. That's the long and the short of it. I mean, could that happen? Certainly. Right? Either the dark... Exactly. exactly, and I agree with you. And in that sense, yeah, let's all go on to the streets. And I would be on the streets and if I could... If I could arm the working class under those... I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm being serious now. I would arm... Uh, the working class to defend the Corbyn uh, government against an army coup. But, and this is where I think we perhaps disagree, I don't think revolutions are just born by people in anger saying, Christ, I'm not going to stand for that, let's go out on the streets. And then we say, oh, let's have a revolution. Right? I think that's a misreading of Russia. I think, you know, uh, it's a misreading of history. I don't think it's Marxism, I think it's anarchism. Right? In my version of the Russian Revolution, Lenin and the Bolsheviks were the mass party of the working class going back to 1905. Right? They were a mass party with deep roots. In 1912, the Bolsheviks win every single worker MP. And I think unless we've done that sort of work, uh, then what we're actually dealing with under those circumstances is not revolution, but counter-revolution. Uh, and, you know, well, think about Chile. Loads of people went out onto the streets. But where did we end up? We ended up in Santiago Football Stadium, not celebrating, right, but being tortured by the bastards. So, in my view, the revolutionaries, the left, need to organise. And I agree, we can do that in the Labour Party. We can do it out if we get kicked out, right? But we need to organise. And we need to organise in a way, in my view... The, well, at least the three of us here, I don't know about Judith, where you actually stand now, <laughs> we ought to be in the same organisation <laughs> with the ability to argue with each other, have votes and all the rest of it. I think the organisation of the left into the 57 varieties is ridiculous. Right? Having 57 arguments or 1,000 arguments, great. 57 different organisations, it's a recipe for fucking, excuse my language, for chaos. Um, no, it's not the way forward. Oh, um, so, what, so, question there and there. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Jamie, you mentioned that, um, uh, that the divide uh, was hollowed out when you produced the same as the mice which were made a few years ago. <laughs> uh, they seem to, they seem to be cut from a different sort of cloth, and you are um, tended to be very, very timid and just stitching things up all the time. Um, but there seems to be a broader issue, which is that, okay, Labour students have been called out, so is everything else. Partly, this is how Corbyn has managed to win, because it, it, it's, it's a back, the, the attempt to further hold out the Labour Party backfired, so I kind of I want to know if you sort of have any thoughts about rebuilding the movement more broadly, you know, in the old days, we have edu this educational society. So, uh, that this, this, this would have a much bigger role in people's day-to-day -day lives than just who do I vote for, even like, do I go to a council meeting or something like that. Yeah. Um, 
uh, joining the Labour Party, not joining the Labour Party. Yes, it is. You know, know what the, the, there is a rule about revolutionaries not being allowed to join the Labour Party in clause 5, 2, A, C, sub clause 12, or whatever. But you, you yourself described the Chartists going, going for the vote, the physical force of the Chartists even. You know, smashing windows, this, that, and the other. And then it seems quite odd that you seem to be saying, well, we couldn't join the Labour Party because it's against the rules. <laughs> as revolutionaries, we should obviously have followed the rules set up by right wingers in the 20s. It's the, the, the Communist Party, when it was trying to affiliate, didn't, you know, politely ask. You know, they, they fought for it. I don't think we're ever going to overturn that sort of rule unless we fight for it within the Labour Party. Yeah. My question is to all the panellists, but maybe particularly to Judith uh, as the oldest on the panel. And it's about the 60s, and the fact that, uh, as far as I'm aware, Corbyn and Bernie Saunders are both, uh, were both kind of politicised in the 60s, it's about the 60s generation. And that generation, that kind of political period, was one of uh, something of a cultural crisis. Um, after which, a lot of uh, there was also something of a revolutionary um, political, political uprising in different parts of the world in that time, but which led to some kind of perhaps more culturally liberal <coughs> present that we have today afterwards, but which also led to um, neo, what we call neoliberalism, I suppose, or the, uh, Thatcher and Reagan. Um, and I guess my question is, what, in what way are we in a different period today to that? And what could we learn from that? Well, we're not seeing revolutions around the world. But um, if you want to look at the countries that seemed inspiring, it's going the other way. And I'm not as bothered by the market as Jack is. So, in fact, I believe that the market in its proper place is part of, uh, it's not capitalist. It didn't get invented by capitalists. And uh, it can also be emancipatory because you don't have people telling you what to buy and sell. It, it, obviously, the extension of the market to things like healthcare, there are good economic reasons not to do it. But Vietnam, it's a rollback uh, if you want to look at what's happening in Vietnam or China. Um, and so uh, whether or not you think, if some people don't, that it was ever socialist, it certainly is going towards the market. Um, so it's not as inspiring. Uh, <coughs> the world is more fearful. It's more like the 30s. Uh, that is that instead of a feeling that things are going forward and there are new steps forward, maybe they're defeated a bit. But there's, uh, instead, you look across the world and you see these really disturbing things. Um, and so this is a protest movement in a different way. It's not pushing the envelope of emancipation, but it's your counterfire. It's trying to keep where we are. Um, that's the first thing. Um, and the, the movement then included, in my view, it was really, especially in the United States. I spent some of the 60s in the United States and some here. And uh, it, it, it was really linked with all the things we take for granted today. When I lived with somebody in Britain in 1964, it was, everybody talked about it. They're not married and they live together. I mean, it's unbelievable now, right? Um, and some of the other changes. I'm as critical as the next person of all the, well, certainly of American racism particularly, but about gender inequality now, but the difference is enormous. Um, and so uh, there were those kinds of gains, which you could call uh, reform, reformist or social democratic, that were still to be had. And then there was a lifestyle thing for young people, which was certainly felt it more. And you don't have that between your parents and uh, the present generation, mostly. I think it's some... Uh, minority and ethnic communities in Britain, it's still the case. Uh, and I imagine perhaps some mining communities or things like that, where you still have old-fashioned values, I'm not sure. But So that's my view on the 60s and being different. And it made it easier in some ways, but it, it wasn't necessarily very politicized. You know, uh, some of it was... Uh, you just have to look at what they did when they celebrated the anniversary of 1968. And, and they decided to have uh, gold chocolate bricks to have paving stones and things. So it became a, a fashion statement. Uh, there was a little bit of that. So that's what I think. I, I, but I, I, I just add one final thing. I don't think we know enough about what is co the composition of the people. 
Uh, I don't particularly want to see the, uh, well, I imagine the sociologists will be mucking in there. But you know, who are the young people? Who were their parents? What were their values? What are they doing? We just know their age. Uh, and, and that's rather important, too, to know more about it. The American New Left was quite different from the British Left, too, for various reasons. So, anyway, that's enough. But you should watch some films. <laughs> well, I'm interested in you saying the 60s were not politicized. Like, because, in a sense, um, my feeling is there's a lot of nostalgia, on, even on the left today, amongst people that didn't even live through the 60s, for yes. the 60s. Yes. Um, so what's, what's that about? Because I feel like something about the Corbyn phenomenon and the Sanders phenomenon plays into that. Um, and maybe other, other people can come in on this too, but um, I do feel there's a kind of nos- nostalgia about a 60s type of movementism. Um, uh, that still had captures people's imagination today, and I and I wonder when you say it's not, it wasn't that politicized, like well, what was missing? What I really meant is some maybe it's better put this way that uh, I was skeptical about where the platypus likes a lot emancipatory, and then I began to think no, the sixties was emancipatory. I don't mean it emancipated everybody. I meant that this is what I meant by pushing the envelope, that the kind of world that when I graduated from high school in 1960 and the kind of world that uh, the 60s exited with 1970. It was a change. It was a dramatic change. And that's what we're looking for in a way, the same kind of burst of freedom. But I don't see that there's room for it in the same way. So everybody sort of belongs to a general movement. You could recognize people by how they looked. You can't tell a Corbinite except for the badge, as far as I know. Uh, They don't have a particular look you would have known who was against the war and who, in the United States particularly, which is what a lot of people, it's more that, the, the American 60s, is, even though Britain had a strong 60s as well, um, late 60s, that, um, that's what I think. So that's what I meant by not so political. I meant maybe it's better to say it was more cultural as well. That's the nostalgia. Other people? Jack? I lived through the 60s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> became political. I mean, the, the, all I would say, all I would say, is at least in Britain, the idea that you have a generation. Yes. I mean, it's obviously absurd. Yes. When people talk about young people, this old people, that I, I don't, I don't despair, but it's quite clearly untrue. It's quite, you know, it's quite clearly untrue, isn't it? You know, I mean, the fact of the matter is, if we talk about those that were growing their hair as men or sleeping uh, with their boyfriend. This was, I can promise you, I promise you, a very minority thing. Where nowadays, in terms of films and all the rest of it, it's portrayed that everybody was all trendy and uh, wearing loom pants and all the rest of it. Uh, the fact of the matter is we were dealing with very small numbers of people. But what I can say, and this is why I profoundly agree with you, uh, Judith, is that as a young person... I felt I had possibilities. I felt brave. You know, uh, sod them. I will go out and do it, and I don't give a damn about the consequences. I don't care whether you sack me. I don't care whether you kick me out of school. I don't care what you do. I've got confidence because the world is changing. And that certainly is what I felt. Uh, So, yeah, the 60s wasn't everybody uh, doing it. It was a minority. But that minority, in that sense in many respects, has become the norm. You know, in terms of what's set, uh, you know, homosexuality, um, women's liberation, you know, anti-racism. I mean, I was going to say, watch films. I mean, I, the, the films I was going to quote is if, on the one side, you know, like public school boys shooting up um, headmaster and all that sort of it, and then on the buses. And if you really want to find out what the 60s were really like, I would watch on the buses. Very like a British <laughs> reference, so maybe platypus in the US will be kind of amused by that. But that's they should watch you. Um, uh, uh, another point to come up is emancipatory, and at the beginning we would I, I, we're going to go on till nine. So I'm going to ask this I'm going to ask this question, and then like ask the panelists to maybe respond and follow up, uh, and we'll finish at nine. But um, emancipatory emancipation. Um, so f- before <coughs> during the conversation, we've talked about socialism, but it seems to have been talked about in terms of 
um, central planning, um, equality, um, possibly like equal distribution or something. But but this term emancipatory has only come up now. Um, I just wanted to kind of note that, and I wondered um, if people could respond if if where where that question of um, freedom has 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 gone from our kind of um, idea about what what it means to be socialist today. Um, I, I'd just like to hear uh, from everyone about. Um, it, where does freedom sit in, in one's ima- uh, sort of imagination of socialism? So it's, it's interesting that it hasn't come up till now. Um, and again, maybe just to tie it down a bit more concretely, um, if that's something that's important to your visions of a better future society, um, uh, what, is, what kind of politics are possible today? Um, and and how um, yeah I mean obviously there's this kind of how we get from here to there uh, and perhaps there's some agreement on the panel um, but it still seems um, I I don't know I mean in in a sense uh, yeah I'd just like to hear a little bit more about whether about this question of equality versus freedom um, Marx's idea of being the freedom of each being a condition for a freedom of all um, versus equal distribution, uh, centra- centralized sort of um, planning, and then yeah, politics. <laughs> what what's politically possible right now, and what should we do? Sorry, that's a big question, but. Um, Okay, so will this be your final? It will be my final, even though we agree that I'll be last, but I'll go first. (laughs) I mean, okay, I mean, all I'd say in in freedom is yes, freedom, but again, freedom for who, to do what, and all the rest of it. But yes, I mean, to me, the socialist project, the communist project, can be described as um, as as freedom. Um, But I I think the crucial thing to me (coughs) is the full development of each individual. And you know, Marx famously said, "Well, that's dependent on overall." Um, condition, so that it has to be freedom for all to fully uh, develop. I just wanted to, it, 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 to come back and say what you were saying, uh, because no one answered you. Yes, it's quite right to raise up the need. It's quite all the stuff you're saying. I, I can nod along with, but the job of us lot, as I see it, is to really put forward the big picture. And it's not a question of demanding socialism now or everything else is an irrelevance. That's not our job. But it is our job to talk about socialism. It is our job to say, well, socialism isn't about Stalinist Russia. Right? That to me, central planning isn't telling you what to eat, what to produce. It's about people getting together and coordinating. I mean, that would be a, a, a phrase for me. So, to me, uh, the main job uh, of the left today is that we are in that sense, the carriers of an idea, uh, not just any old idea, but the idea of freedom. See, m- my version of the, the left is the left, yeah, can play a great role in organising demonstrations, and protests, lobbies of councils, all the rest of it. But I mean, damn it, to me, that's not what Marxism um, is about. Marxism is about the overall uh, picture of how do we precisely go from here to there, and I'm not going to deal with... Um, that I think the others maybe will do that. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, what we're talking about is an emancipatory project because we will be freeing ourselves from capitalist exploitation. But I think the reason why we don't talk about it in terms of freedom is that that's that that's a word that means something different to lots of people, and it is and it is to quite a large extent actually owned by the right that you have a sort of libertarian right that it's all about complete freedom from any social responsibility. So I think if we don't talk about it in those terms, that's probably why, just because it's so open to sort of misunderstanding. I think, and you don't want to sound like you're going to kind of get some guns and going to hole up in an Oregon nature reserve, which you possibly would do if you, if you kind of did with some of that you know, sound libertarian. I think. Um, I also did want to come back on the points that you, you were making. Um, 
I mean, yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you that, you know, you don't, it's not that you have kind of revolutionary tactics and then in all circumstances that's correct. I mean, that's a form of thinking that if you only get the headline on the front of your paper exactly right, then the proletariat will rise up. I mean, this is the importance of objective circumstances and actually being organised so that you're ready to take advantage of those objective circumstances when they are favourable. You do have to have both of those things, so I really wouldn't be wanting to imply anything different. Um, I think... I don't, I don't think it really matters if Corbyn himself is the right person or not. Um, I don't think it's about him, it's about what he stands for. I mean, I, I would like to stress that. I mean, he's a very nice guy. I feel, I feel like we're kind of talking about him as if he's really, really awful. And they're like, no, he's, he's, he's a lovely chap. Um, but I think the point is that when people talk about, oh, he's not going to get enough votes, that's part, that's part of our job, which isn't, isn't necessarily about saying, OK, we have to go out and do the canvassing. It's actually about changing the conversation. I mean, this kind of brings us back to what we were just saying about the 60s and, and, and the 70s, which I, I can't remember the 60s, I can remember the 70s. And the thing is, in the 70s in Britain, society in general was very much more left-wing than it is now. I mean, Corbyn now looks like the most radical that there ever was. Well, he's not. In the 70s, he was not particularly remarkably left-wing, his position, just that everyone else has moved way to the right. And that's something that we, whether in the Labour Party or not, can do, is move that conversation leftwards again, we move the norms leftwards. And that actually is how, is, is, is how Labour are going to win the next election, if they're going to win. That's the only way that that could happen. And that's something that can happen within the Labour Party, but also outside of it. And that's part of beginning to create those objective circumstances that you were correctly talking about. Um, the final thing I wanted to say, I don't want to go on and on about joining the Labour Party. My point about, about not joining because it's breaking the rules, it's kind of, personally, I don't like lying. If I have to say I believe this to join an organisation, and actually I don't believe that, I'm not comfortable doing that. That's a personal thing, but I'm not. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that actually it's not about revolutionaries not joining because it's against the rules, it's about revolutionaries being witch hunted out because it's against the rules, so there's a kind of a practical thing there. But the thing I wanted to end on was this point about the sort of the left being in 57 different varieties. I mean, this is a criticism that, you know, this is always leveled at the revolutionary left, but it's also ridiculous that we all have our different groups and you know, we'll be in the same organisation. And, you know, I don't think that it really matters. I, th- I think, actually, it would matter if we refused to have anything to do with each other. You know, if I insisted, no, I'm not going to be on the panel with them because I, I don't agree with them. That would start mattering. As long as we're working together in the campaigns that matter, you know, it's fine that there's weekly worker and counterpart. This is OK. You know, you can read two papers. You don't have to only pick one. I, I think the kind of idea that the left won't get anywhere unless we all merge into one organisation, I don't think that's true. I think there's a thing called the United Front, which is where we get together and work together even though we're in separate organisations. So, you know, I'm not going to be in Momentum, but I want very much to work with Momentum because I think we agree on an awful lot of fundamental things. And I think they kind of when when people, sometimes when people raise the oh you're all just in all these little sets, it's all silly, that's kind of an excuse for not getting involved. And I think we need to get over that and understand that as long as we're working together, actually there is a growing number of us and I think we have real possibilities to actually get to where we want to be. Cool. Um, I don't want to come back to this Labour Party membership thing too much, but like, <laughs> if your issue is like revolutionaries getting chased out, surely it's better to actually be in there to fight for the plural Labour Party. Uh, me and Jack sort of agree on that represents all the different tendencies. Again, it's the thing of like, what do you mean getting beat up? But I, I, I'm going to leave that question there because I think we, we've, we've gone on about it far too much. Although it's, it's important. Um, just to come back to the question you, you asked me about. Um, the kind of hollowness of kind of like, I guess not just like live students, but like kind of like university life in general, like uni life isn't as political as so it has been. more about the, 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 the work of students out, you think about declining trade union movement. Yeah, yeah. And cooperatives being co-op, the co-op itself. And the, yeah, the, the it's not very cooperative, yeah. Um, so yeah, just something that came to mind was like um, the work, the national campaign against Freedom Cuts did in NUS, and those don't know this. It's somewhat of a left turn that's been happening for about two years in the US. Um, a majority of this NEC is essentially left wing and have, um, uh, have voted through a lot of like left wing policy, particularly about things like free education, which were like unthinkable years ago. Um, and, and like like you know, the NUS absolutely sold out the student movement in twenty ten. Um, and you'd think from the masses of people on the streets that they were just taken over straight away, but it actually took a lot of time. I think the thing that NCFC was very good at was, um, it's essentially like a federal group, but actually just building groups on a lot of different campuses. Um, 
and doing stuff around like political education, you know, not only in terms of like, you know, Marx, but about getting people out onto picket lines and things like that. And eventually that translated to what's slowly happening where, where the left's actually able to take some power in, in, in NUS. So I think it's essentially like politicising uni life. Um, Builders in the union is quite, quite grassroots is quite important. I think that can essentially <laughs> translate into the left winning things like Labour students, Young Labour, and I don't know if we'll win them this year, but we might, we probably will over the next few years. Um, so, the that. Um, a kind of question of freedom, I think we could probably have like a whole debate about that in itself, can we? But like, I know this is kind of big, but I, I think in lots of senses it comes to the core of socialism, it's about just being able to have like a nice life. Uh, Still, when we talk about free education, it's because we want people to have a, like a nice life, but they just don't have like huge debts hanging over them. Um, like essentially, like freedom from work in lots of ways. If we did get some sort of socialist shift, I think one of the first things we want to do is cut down the working week, but keep people's pay the same, and let technology do all of these things. So we're not just having to like work to pay for this car that gets us to work and wherever else. Um, and I think it's about like freeing up institutions in society. I think I think our education system is is pretty awful, very dictatorial. Um, actually, actually with a charity post like democratic education, like like it's about freeing those things up so like um, students can kinda like learn what they want when they want to learn it and things like that. Um, in higher education it's not just about free education but again it's about democratising that process, about the curriculums reflecting things that are useful to us, not just useful for the market. So like there's a kind of broad sense of what I think freedom is, but I actually think it's quite important to our principle of socialism. And there's, there's just one other problem I know with Dan as well, um, like lots of language, like words like liberty, you just tend to associate with the right, which um, I think is a problem in itself, because I think like in the left, we should be in favour of things like, you know, like freedom of speech, freedom of association, stuff like that. But because those sorts of terms being taken over by the right, I think it's like why the student, well, half the student went in an absolute state at the moment, where people like, like outright say they hate free speech, um, Socialist Workers Party Society here got banned. I don't like the Socialist Workers Party, but I'm, I'm for their right to put their, their case forward. So I think like um, it's probably just like on those basic levels that sometimes we associate with the right, but um, putting like the left into them. Um, how we get there, is, I think it's just about building um, independent working class power. I think the sort of force we need to get there, whether it's through government or otherwise, would need basically a power it can lean on that is based on like the organised working class rather than what it does now, like the banks and everything else. Um, and that's that's a process in itself. So yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to use my final uh, minute or so uh, to illustrate one danger that I can see in people who think that they're basically revolutionaries joining the Labour Party. That is that I'm sitting here, I know I'm not really considering myself a leftist anymore. I've left the Labour Party twice in my life. I'm not going to do it again. And <laughs> so I'm not joining it, and I'm not a revolutionary. But I do know this, that you're all nice people. These are nice people. I have some very nasty, sarcastic things I want to say, and I'm not going to say them. I was going to work myself up to do it. It would start with this... Uh, central planning is about people getting together to plan. I, I, I know that Jack Conrad is smarter than that. Uh, whatever that means, it's not what it, it's no. It's not even a vision. It's not even a vague outline. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I I know these are intelligent people, and if I disagree, I do it politely. So what happens to people who join the Labour Party, including sign? You start with signing something. Do you have to do anything else? That's the point. To uh, make your politics uh, acceptable. And the phrase that I've always heard is the idea that you put on a mask. And that's okay, because you think there's a time that's going to come when you take off the mask and they'll see the Bolshevik fangs underneath. But instead, by the time you take off the mask, this is, you find it's grown into your face. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important point. So maybe you have to tug at your mask every once in a while. That's why I actually made myself say something slightly nasty but believe me, it's not what I really wanted to say, and it's not enough to make people uh, that way. So you have to be cautious about that in that sort of an atmosphere. And I think that's a problem that uh, uh, everybody faces. Um, I, I mean, I, uh, where you draw the line, is it just signing something, 
I swore an oath of loyalty to Her Majesty the Queen, her heirs and successors, because I wanted a British passport. I didn't want to be an American anymore. I don't think I really betrayed something with that. But on the other hand, if I was always supposed to go and you know turn up for uh, uh, Barry, the Queen's birthday, it would be different. So I, I think you have to look at yourself that way when making that balance between being effective in the Labour Party and um, not actually doing what you were talking about, which is uh, saying something you don't really believe. That's really all.